1789, France is in turmoil as the Ancien Regime is overturned and the Assemblée Nationale abolishes feudalism and the privileges of nobility and clergy, declares the rights of man. The Bastille is stormed and the king is forced to accept a constitutional monarchy. A feeling of freedom and enlightenment sweep the nation. The country's best minds come here to the assembly to make impassioned speeches. But the crushing debt is a problem. Some suggest the issuance of notes to bring back liquidity and prosperity. Resistance is fierce. Jacques Necker, finance minister, argues passionately that printing money would lead down a dangerous path and reminds the assemblée of the Mississippi bubble and John Law, still in living memory for many. Necker was savagely attacked by the proponents of the Assignats. You see, they had a cutting plan. They were gonna confiscate property from the church and they would do a one-time issuance of 400 million livres. You see, this was the collateralized mortgage obligation of its day. Limited, one time, backed by property. What could possibly go wrong? The debt crisis escalated. Silver disappeared from the market. There was an outcry for paper money, but the defenders of sound money were eloquent. They remembered John Law in the Mississippi Company. Names like Necker, DuPont, Morey. For a whole year, this debate raged between paper money and hard money. The paper money crowd said, it's gonna be a one-time deal, fully collateralized. And in the end, by just a handful of votes, 400 million livres of assignats was approved. Pierre, help me to understand something. In 1720, the Mississippi bubble collapsed and brought devastation to France and to its people. 70 years later, France again turned to paper currency. How could this happen? To keep the revolution going, Talleyrand had this genius idea, if I may say. He said, we're going to stall to take everything which belongs to the Vatican. And as you know, the Vatican at the time was extremely powerful. They, the Vatican, just the Pope, hold almost half of Europe. They invented this extraordinary thing, which is, uh, in French, uh, uh, just uh, la caisse de l'extraordinaire. La caisse de l'extraordinaire. In English, which is the um, uh, extraordinary cash register. <laughs> you, can, you can make that up. Uh, I mean, and this extraordinary cash register was made to sell everything which they, they take from the Vatican. So they confiscated the land from, all, uh, from, the, from the Vatican churches people, and everything. everything. And they Catholics. created this assignat in order to sell all of this property to raise money exactly. to pay for the deficits. So it, it was not a paper currency in the beginning because it was even, uh, they gave some interest on it. Uh, you, the French government was giving interest uh, before realizing that it was a, such a good idea that they just transferred in, in paper money <laughs> and we started all over again. The second time was easier. The issue was a wonder. The government paid off their expenses, the people got their shiny new assignats, commerce was stimulated and liquidity increased. However, after just five months, the government had spent the money and since it continued to run a deficit, soon cries were raised for another assignat issue. The second assignat issue only took three months to approve, and it was passed by a large majority, 503 to 423. 800 million livres were to be issued. Necker resigned. The royal family fled to Tuileries Palace wearing servant clothes, but was arrested at Varennes. The assignat had already started losing value. Gold, silver, copper were all driven out of circulation, but the people wanted more. In fact, the government issued another 100 million livres of assignats. Prices kept going higher, but people wanted more. It was a vicious cycle. Prices higher, more assignats. Foreigners, exiled nobles, shopkeepers, the church, all were blamed for rising prices, but not the assignat. Speculation was rampant as people tried to protect themselves against the depreciating currency. A new speculator class emerged that actually wanted more of this funny money, and they pressured government to keep the printing presses rolling. On December 1791, 
A new issue was authorized, another 800 million livre. Meanwhile, the value of the first issue continued to drop from 100 livre nominal to 53 livre. In March, Calvier became the Minister of Finance, promising to speed up printing. In April came the fifth large issue, 500 million livre. But many smaller issues and reissues were simultaneously being carried out. Issue after issue followed through 1792, every couple of months, up to a total of three and a half billion. Food prices continued to rise. In August of 1792, food riots led to the end of the constitutional monarchy with the Paris Commune insurgency, the assault on the Tuileries Palace, arrest of the royal family, and the Jacobin takeover of the Assemblée. The guillotine started to work overtime. So they broke their promise. Instead of limiting the amount of circulation, they went to increasing amounts of circulation. So maybe after the first year, they did another one, and then after six months? Exactly. Like the John Law stuff, it was exactly the same thing. So they just, you know, it was, it's always very easy for government just to, to use the printer and to print money. King Louis XVI was guillotined on January 1793. War intensified and the reign of terror really got going. War and money printing got prices skyrocketing. The Jacobins introduced the law of the maximum to put a ceiling on prices. This only led to shopkeepers and shops disappearing because the penalty for violating this law was death. Dragoons went into the countryside looking for food and the shops here in Paris were attacked by mobs. Meanwhile, Assignats kept rolling off the printing press and all efforts to prop up their value failed. In 1794, Assignats issued totaling seven billion livres. In May of 1795, 10 billion. In July of 1795, 14 billion. Creditors were wiped out and the debtors rejoiced. So the maximum was essentially a form of price control where the shopkeeper could only charge so much. But it never worked, like they never worked during Rome but he would be forced to accept currency which was worth less than the goods that he exactly. was going to save. So, so the shopkeeper closed up shop rather than accept the forced currency. Exactly, like it was during uh, Neron and uh, all these uh, Roman emperors who would started to uh, uh, mixing up silver and copper. And that destroyed the economy even worse than the currency collapse itself. Exactly. History is keeping repeating himself. In October of 1795, the convention fell and was substituted by the directory by then, the guillotine had become a standard part of governmental succession. The directory tried to replace the, by now almost worthless, assignats with a new issue by a different name, Mandat. This was short-lived. Assignats continues to circulate, but were increasingly worthless. So ultimately, when the assignat collapsed, we went into what was called the, the Mandat or the Mandat? Mandat, mandat National, if I remember well. Mandat and it only lasted one, one year, year, but it was also a form of paper currency. Definitely. It was just only plain paper. <laughs> if there was, you, you didn't even have the, the, some church property to back, the, to back up the money. <laughs> so that's, that's amazing. You know, it was just the trust of the, of the revolutionary government and nobody trusted it anymore. The directory marks the end of the French Revolution. Bone-crunching poverty gripped the nation. They feared the rise of the military. And they were right. In 1799, the coup of Napoleon, who brought in the consulate and then the empire. When I live, I will never resort to irredeemable paper. He never did. And the gold franc held until World War I. The bottom line is, is that sometimes people, and particularly politicians, don't learn from monetary history. Definitely. I mean, history is repeating himself, especially right now. I mean, we can see exactly the same thing. To, to what we're seeing today is what the French people have seen, you know, like 200 years before with John Law. I think the, the bottom line is, is that people should get their history books out and see what's happened before. <laughs> yeah, but people are too lazy to open, uh, you know, their school books, so... <laughs> Hopefully they'll be watching this video. Seems like when anyone, anywhere, fools with fiat money, catastrophe follows. 
James, is anyone going to learn from this history? Well, let's hope this time we learn from history so we don't have to relive it. Let's go to the cafe and buy some gold. There's a, a flaw in human nature that we're always thinking that there's a free lunch in this world. John Law, heading up the Bank Generale, started issuing banknotes. Well, people really fantasized about, about it. People started to hoard more gold and silver. The state went door to door and confiscated it. And the entire country went down the drain.